And as always, I want to remind you that you have cards in the seat back in front of you. This is our way of communicating back and forth. If you have a prayer concern, if you have a need, a question, if you uh, are considering a next step, this is the way that we can respond to those requests or needs. So please uh, make use of those. Put those in the offering boxes on your way out or take them to Connection Point. We would love uh, to interact with you in whatever uh, way that we can. So today we begin a new series uh, entitled The Word became flesh. The word became flesh. This is a familiar phrase uh, to Jesus followers taken from a very familiar passage of scripture, uh, what we call the prologue uh, to the gospel of John, John chapter one. And so every week uh, in the month of December, we are going to be reading verses one through 18 in John's prologue, looking at the four uh, main points that John makes in this passage about Jesus, the word become flesh. Jesus is the word of God. He is the light of God. God, the glory of God. He is the wonder of God. And so today we consider Jesus the word of God. Stand with me as we read the gospel of John chapter one, starting with verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word and the truth that we find in it. Open up your word to us. Open up our hearts and spirits to receive this truth as we seek to know you more and more, to follow you, and to live the life that you created and saved us for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is the word of God. Way back at the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis opens with these words, in the beginning. In the beginning, and it goes on to describe how God spoke all things into existence. Uh, this thought is reiterated throughout scriptures. Uh, Psalm 33, uh, God spoke and it came to be. First Peter 2, uh, 3, 5, the earth was created by the word of God. That first chapter in the Bible unfolds the creation of all things, the separation of light and darkness, life bursting forth out of the void how God made man in his image, in his likeness. And then two chapters later continues on, uh, showing us how the created one rejected its own creator. And then from that point on, it continues into the unfolding of the redemption of that creation by the love of God. John uses this account of the first creation to announce God's new creation by identifying the God who spoke. So we are officially uh, in what the, call, uh, what the church calls the season of Advent. Uh, these are the four weeks leading up to Christmas that celebrate not only the fact that Jesus came, but that Jesus is coming. We not only celebrate the coming of Jesus, but we look forward in hope to the recoming, the return of Jesus. This is Christmas. A recent Barna survey uh, found that 90% of all Americans will celebrate the Christmas holiday only 52% of those Americans indicate that they celebrate Christmas for a religious or faith-based reason. Now, question. 
How many of you have started the Christmas movie binge on the Hallmark Channel? Please do not raise your hand. <laughs> Miracle on 34th Street, It's a Wonderful Life, The Christmas Story, my personal favorite elf. I apologize for that. Every Christmas movie... Every Christmas movie, secular or otherwise, and as well as every marketing strategy during this season, attempts to do what John has done so, so miraculously here in the introductory verses of his gospel, capture the wonder of the moment, to capture the wonder of the season, right? There is a majestic, magical wonder about Christmas, and every movie does this. It doesn't matter how hokey or ridiculous it is. At some point in the movie, you're going to have a moment, a moment that tries to make sense of the season, the magic of the season. Why are we doing this? Why are we celebrating this? Well, out of the four Gospels in the New Testament, we have three accounts of the true reason for the season. Uh, most familiar is the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, uh, who focus on the historical events, the historical narrative of the birth, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, the angels. But in John's Gospel, John, John chapter 1, uh, there is no star, no manger, no inn with no room. But it is no less the story of Advent. Because here's the deal, my friends. The world may not celebrate Christmas because of the babe in the manger, but think about it. Followers of Jesus... Don't either. We celebrate not because of the star or the stable. We celebrate because the word became flesh. We celebrate the incarnation of Christ. We celebrate the fact that God came to us and dwelt among us. Friends, this is the Christmas story. The non-negotiable reality that the eternal God, the infinite, transcendent, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, immutable God of the universe became a human being and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew and Luke begin with the birth of Jesus. John begins with the birth of time. Uh, the infinite becoming the finite. So the question is, why does John write in this way? How does, why does he begin in this way? And we have to get to the very end of his gospel to find out why. In chapter 20, verse 31, he says, These are written, I've written this gospel, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In chapter 1, John doesn't give us the name of this life for 28 verses in. He just introduces him as the Word. The Word. In the Greek language, it is logos. Logos. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. In verse 1, we have the logos mentioned three times. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Friends, it was a perfect way for John to identify Jesus to his targeted audience. First, to the Greek, uh, most influenced by the likes of Aristotle and Plato, who viewed the human being in a dualistic form, the body and the spirit. They believed in both, but they, they also understood the spirit to be superior to the body. And then to the Jewish mind, who viewed God as utterly transcendent from creation. So here's the, the, the Greeks. The Greeks wanted to separate the body from the spirit because the spirit was superior to the body. The Jews wanted to separate God from the human, obviously because God is superior to the human. But for both, the material was inferior to the immaterial or the spiritual which made the claim that John is making here scandalous. The word became flesh. Well, first, how? But more importantly, why? Why? The incarnate Logos, fully God, fully man. The word Logos was loaded with meaning. And, God, and John doesn't explain the word Logos, which indicates that, uh, indicates that it needed no explanation. Everybody knew what John was talking about, what he was referring to. Because in that culture, the word logos was the title given to the creative force, the ordering intelligent mind of the universe. For the Greek, logos was the reason, was reason with a capital R. It was the principle of reason. It was the order, the explanation of all things. It was the reason for our existence. Logos was the word. Uh, it is the word from which we get the word logic, that which makes sense. And so for the Greek, this is, this is what made sense. 
Now in the Bible, Psalm 8, Psalm 19, Romans 1, it tells us you cannot look at this universe, you cannot look at this complex world around you, the intricate details of creation, and not reason. I mean, it's just logical that a design would require a designer. The Greeks knew this. They didn't have a name for it. They couldn't describe it or explain it. They thought it was impersonable, unknowable. However, for the Jew, Logos did make sense. It was reasonable. All through the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to them. I mean, it was simply God revealing himself. When I look at the heavens and the work of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him, that you would speak to him, that you would reveal yourself? I mean, it's just logical. God has spoken. (laughs) But that's God, not, not us. So as with John, the New Testament goes on, Hebrews chapter 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So John says to both Jew and Greek, let me introduce to you the fact that this logos is a person, And that he doesn't just speak the word of God, he is the word of God, fully God and fully man. Philippians chapter 2, he was made in the likeness of men. Hebrews 2, 14, he partook of flesh and blood. Colossians 2, 9, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, fully God, fully man. Charles Wesley, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. John gives us three unique characteristics of this word, this logos, demonstrating the deity of Jesus, and all of them have to do with his existence, his pre-existence, co-existence, and self-existence. Logos, the word, the logos. Now, you will find this word tagged to a lot of English words in our own language, logos, ology, ology, it means the branch of study or the study of. So we, etymology, the study of words. Geology, the study of the earth. Theology, the study of God, right? Cardiology, dermatology, whatever. In this series, in the next several weeks, we are going to do what is called Christology. Everybody say Christology. What is that? That is the study of Christ. The study of, are you ready to do some study today? All of this is going to be on the quiz, so you better take good notes, okay? So here here, here we go, friends. Number one, back to John chapter one, point one. The Logos pre-existed the world. It pre-existed the world. In the beginning, here's John's message. In the beginning was the word. Question, what beginning? The beginning of what? Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. That's that's the beginning. Uh, The word existed in the beginning. In the beginning, the word was. In other words, the word was there when the beginning began, right? Jesus was already in existence when everything that exists came into existence. In the English language, it's harder for us to see this, but in the Greek language, it uses a tense of the verb uh, form, uh, the imperfect tense, describing continuous reality, and so it was easier to see this in in the Greek, which is to say, in the beginning, the word already existed. There was never a time when the word began. Why? Because Jesus exists outside of time. He has no beginning and no end. This is why he could say later on in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. I am the Logos. Number two, the Logos coexisted with God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. In other words, he not only existed as God, he existed with God, which is to say not only is he the eternal God, but he is distinct from the eternal God. So not only is he, is he God, but he's distinct from God. What, what is that? Well, that's very hard to understand. That's what that is. <laughs> I mean, two verses in, And John gives us one of the most difficult theological doctrines in all of Christendom. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Colossians 2, 9. In him, all the fullness of deity dwells. Jesus is co-equal to God, co-exists with God, but is distinct from God in his own person. The Logos Friends, it's not a message from God. It is not an emanation from God. It is not the creation of God. The Word is with God, and the Word 
is God. The doctrine of the Trinity is the only way to understand what John is saying here. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that God spoke creation into existence. It also tells us that the Spirit of God hovered over that creation. And then we find in Hebrews chapter 1 that it was Jesus used as the agent through which this world, this existence, came to exist. God in three persons. This is what makes the Christmas story the Christmas story. The one who came into the world is not from God. He is God. God the Son, who was eternally with God before the creation of the world, has stepped into the world, pre-existent, co-existent, and thirdly, self-existent as God. Self-exists with God as God. So, when you speak of his pre-existence, you are grappling with his eternality. Jesus is eternal. When you consider his coexistence with God, you're grappling with his equality. His equality with God. An equality which Philippians 2 tells us he was not willing to hold on to so that he could come to earth for us. And so when you think of his self-existence, you're now contemplating the very essence of his nature, this God who is the Son. How are we to understand Jesus? Well, in verse 4, John tells us, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. This was an amazing statement to both Jews and Greeks. This is an amazing statement to you and me in the 21st century. Life. He is life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word is not bios. The word is zoe. Two Greek words, both translated life, but containing distinct messages and meanings. Bios, which gives us the word biology, right? Logos, the study of life. But zoe is this word that John uses, meaning the, the life principle or the rela- reality of life, the spiritual aspect of life, the life that is beyond life. There's a life that exists in conjunction with the human body, but then there is a life that goes beyond the functioning of the human body. Friends, listen to this. You were created by a God who has no beginning and no end. You were created with a beginning, but no end. Friends, you were created to be an eternal being. You were created by life, for life. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. In him was life, but not just life, life that is truly life. Jesus is the essence of life, eternal life. He is not, he's not just given life, he contains life in himself. He's the source of life the sustainer of life. It is in him that we find life and that life exists. As Paul said in Acts chapter 17, in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. Again, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, they all knew this. They all understand this. This logos, they just didn't have a name for it. And John says, this is his name, Jesus. Jesus, God in the flesh. It was John who said later on in his letter, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, this logos of life in him was life, biological life, everything from, the, from that one created, uh, that one celled amoeba to the most complex of creation, human beings, but more than that, f- far more than that, friends, breathing into the one made in his image, the very breath of life making him a living soul. What is John saying? Friends, when you're looking at the Logos, the Word made flesh. You're looking at the very essence of life itself, the very source of your life. You're considering the one who said, I am the way, the truth. I am the, what? Life. Life. You cannot look at Jesus any other way. Life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. As he said to one grieving sister, overwhelmed by the darkness of death, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question for all of us, friends. That's the Christmas question, is it not? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? 
Or will you be one of those 50% who celebrate Christmas with no reason to do so? Christ is the only one that makes Christmas logical. These things are written so that by believing you may have life in his name. What is John teaching us about Christmas? Number one, the Logos is Lord. The Logos is Lord. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. John is telling us that before time began, Jesus was there, he was God, and he is Lord of creation, therefore he is Lord of life. He Hebrews 1, we we just read verses 1 and 2, but the writer goes on in that passage and says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus created the word the world by the word of his power. I mean, he just spoke the word. And it happened. He just spoke the word, and it was done. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like to do that with a dirty house or or a broken car or rebellious children? He just just created everything with a spoken word, which means, by the way, it didn't take him billions of years to do so. I mean, this is Christmas. It's no time to get into the whole evolution debate, but I'm going to. Uh, (laughs) What's more logical, my friends? To have nothing collide with nothing and out of the random chaos of chemicals that have no explanation of their existence, all that we know now is, I mean, all of this logic came about because of that? Or is it just, isn't it easier to to believe the fact of an eternal God with the power to speak creation into existence. And as for as long as human history has been recorded, we have seen a world functioning with observable and understandable precision. Friends, the only logical argument for evolution is the refusal to believe in the God of creation. I mean, if we can explain creation without God, then we don't have to be accountable to the God of creation, right? I mean, that is a logical argument. The problem is the the, the explanation just doesn't make sense. It's illogical. And that's just it, friends. The refusal to acknowledge the God of creation is the very thing that led Jesus to redeem that creation that rejected him. He made purification for sins and declared it is finished and set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is Lord of life. He is Lord of creation. He is Lord over my life. He is the Logos, the only thing that makes sense. Number two, the Logos is life. In him, John 1, 4, is life. John eleven twenty six. 26, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the source of life. He gave you life. He sustains your life. Apart from Jesus, there is no life. Friends, listen to this. Your, your very existence right at this very moment is dependent on the sovereign grace of God who is sustaining your life. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. Every one of us. I mean, you don't have to love God. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to obey God. You can give no thought to God. It doesn't change any of this. Right now, atheist, agnostic, or believer, every one of us is totally dependent on the word of God's power to keep your life going. You cannot disconnect yourself from the source of your life, the source that sustains your life, and live. Pull a fish out of water. It will not last long. Pull a plant out of the earth. It's only a matter of time. When Adam and Eve rejected their creator, both Bios and Zoe was affected. It not only set up a physical death in their future, it created a spiritual death in their present. And what's more, it instigated the process of decay. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, this process of decay throughout all of creation. Right now, our entire universe is groaning under the weight of sin, longing for its redemption. And so John warns us, If you don't know Jesus, if you're not acknowledging the source of your life, then you're just basically a dead man walking. It's just only a matter of time. Jesus is Lord, and he is life. Number three, he is, the the Logos is love. Love, verse three, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's a pretty generic statement. 
by the way. Uh, if you're not attentive, uh, you'll read it without much impact to yourself, but it has everything to do with you, all things, anything, everything. One of the greatest Christological passages uh, in all of the Bible is found in Colossians chapter 1. This is one of my favorite passages. Start with verse 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. The God which we cannot see, we have now seen in Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to understand God, look at Jesus. If you, want, if, you, if you wonder about what God thinks of you and how he feels about you, just look at the way Jesus treated people like you. Men and women and children. By the way he responded to atheists and agnostics and believers, seekers and strugglers and doubters like you and me. He is the image of the invisible God, verse 16. For he, by him all things were created. All things were created. John chapter 1. All things were made through him. Without him not anything was made that was made. He created everything. He created everything. The Greek philosophers spent their lives trying to figure out the logos. And they couldn't do it. They were driven by all the philosophical questions that every generation of mankind has asked, who am I? Why am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What's the reason for my existence? And John gives us the answer in one name, the name of Jesus. He, he's the answer to who you are and why you are. So friends, make the word everything personal. He created everything. You were a part of the everything. In fact, the Bible makes this clear. You are the most important thing of the everything. You are the highest achievement thing of the everything. He made all things. There's nothing that was made that wasn't made by him, and you were made by him. He delights in the thing that he created. He created you. But Paul doesn't stop with that thought. He just goes on in verse 16 and says, by all things, all things were created through him and what? For him. For, you, he, he created you for, for him. For him. You are not a, just a random project. You are a person in relationship to the creator God of the universe. He loves you that much. He made you to love you. And this is how much he loves you. In him, verse 17, in him all things hold together. The creator God who created you out of love, for relationship, from the rotation of the earth around the sun to the very next breathe, breath that you suck in, nothing happens in your life that Jesus isn't attentive to or compassionate about. He cares about you, for he created you for a relationship with him. Speaking of creation, I think about this. No scientist will dispute that the universe has order. I mean, that's how they have a job. There would be no science without order. It's because of order that we have science. It's because of the order of the universe that we can understand in scientific ways the universe. We would have no other way of understanding the world without order in the world. The problem with science, my friends, is that it can explain the what and the how, but it has no answers for the why and the who. For example, uh, the basic building block of all matter is the atom composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. I'm going to sound like a scientist here. Make no mistake, I am not. But scientists tell us that there is an action and reaction within the nucleus of every atom composing everything that we can see, touch, and, and, and observe and experience. Electrical charges that contradict what scientists know to be true. It's called the law of mutual Repulsion. I mean, when you, put, when you put two positive ends of a magnet together, have you ever tried to do that? And how they repel one another? I mean, it just doesn't work. And that's the question within the atom. Why don't these electrical charges that repel each other, 
blow up the atom. Science shows us that the electrical charges are there, but they cannot explain why this atom just doesn't disintegrate because of those charges. They've tried to come up with an explanation of maybe a second force or a stronger force or some type of nuclear glue that fights against the first force, but they have no idea what this nuclear glue, it, they, 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 don't, they don't know. Well, that sounds familiar, right? They're convinced of the Logos, they just don't know what the Logos is. Well, we're a lot smarter today, right? Science can explain everything. No, not really. They know that something that shouldn't be falling apart, or that should be falling apart, isn't actually falling apart, but they don't know why it's not falling apart. I might have the answer for that. My friends, we have a cosmos, not a chaos. And it's because of the Creator who created you out of love. And here's the deal if He can hold the universe together, He can hold your life together. Regardless of the things that are causing your life to fall apart, I mean, you, you are not exempt from the consequences of a broken world. But what Jesus gives you is an anchor for that brokenness. When your life falls apart, you don't have to fall apart because you have a Jesus, your Savior, your Creator, who's holding your life together. The created, the one who created your life, redeemed your life, is holding your life together no matter what. Jesus is the Logos. He's the reason. He's the only thing that makes sense. We have the Word so that we might believe and find life in his name. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? We've come to a time of communion. If you didn't pick that up on your way out, I encourage you to go get it now in the back of the room. Those of you who have been here a while will notice that the element is different than what we've used in the past, so start with the, the bottom up. Ephesians 1 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Friends, from before the foundation of the world, God already had a plan in place to save you from your rejection of the Creator, from the brokenness that you created for yourself. Friends, this is the reason for Christmas. God created you in his image out of love for a relationship, but he knew you would reject him, and so he set in motion, Paul says, before the creation of the world. God set in motion your redemption. He says it this way in Galatians 4, 4, For when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful that out of your infinite wisdom and love, you decided to come not only to be with us, but you came for us. And in that, Father, we have hope. And may all of us in this room rest in the hope, not just to celebrate that you came, but the hope in your coming because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can stand on the promise and the truth that you will come for us and that you will save us. And so in this, Father, we gather together as a body of believers proclaiming the truth of your word, the Logos, who has come into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.